All right. Well, hello, Family Chapel. Hope everyone is uh, doing well. I know the world is crazy right now, but it's uh, great to see your faces. And uh, thanks to all those that are joining on online. Hopefully you guys are doing well. Also, feel free to say hi in the chat to welcome one another. Uh, but yeah, my name is Josh. I'm one of the pastors here at Family Chapel, and I do have the great privilege of sharing God's Word with us today. Uh, well, we're continuing to introduce our theme for the year, which is renewal. And with this theme of renewal, we're hoping to focus on how we can cultivate healthy rhythms and relationships and even revival that are all marked by the newness of life that is found in Christ. And last week, if you're here with us, you might remember that we took a look at what this life in Christ looks like. And we saw that this life in Christ is a life that satisfies It's a life that illuminates, it shows us the way. It's a life that provides us with security. Uh, It's a life that is costly because Jesus lays down his life so that we can have newness of life. We also saw that it's a life that's eternal. It it overcomes death. It's a life that is exclusive. It's only found in Jesus. And it's a life that is experienced as we abide in Christ. Uh, Well, today I want to take a look at what some of the obstacles are to experiencing that life. You see, I think there are some real challenges when it comes to experiencing renewal. And I'm hoping to explore some of these challenges through the lens of what's being called the metaverse. Now, I know that may sound really strange and random to you. And if you've never heard of that term before, that's totally fine. It's a relatively new term. It's still pretty loosely defined. It's constantly being developed over time. Uh, But this idea of the metaverse is starting to now take some steam. Uh, If you might remember from October of last year, Mark Zuckerberg, the founder of uh, Facebook, announced that Facebook would be changing its name to Meta. Uh, And as one journalist kind of reports, uh, he says, this move is a nod to the metaverse, an immersive next generation version of the internet that relies heavily on virtual reality technology. Instead of browsing or sending messages online, you could feel like you're physically there interacting with virtual versions of real people, places, and things. The metaverse is this emerging digital space where more and more of life is expected to be lived out. Uh, And if you're like a nerd and you want a more precise definition, uh, here's what Matthew Ball, who's a venture capitalist who's investing a lot of money into building out this metaverse, uh, here's how he defines the metaverse. He he says this, I have the quote quote up for you on the screen. He he says, the metaverse is a massively scaled and interoperable network of real-time rendered 3D virtual worlds, which can be experienced synchronously and persistently by an effectively unlimited number of users and with continuity of data, such as identity, history, entitlements, objects, communications, and payments. All right, so that, that's a lot to take in. But, but in other words, uh, the metaverse is a digital world of worlds in which you can live and work and play and interact with others, not just through this medium, but in this medium. In other words, the metaverse is not just life on the internet, which we can already experience through social media, through Facebook, through things like that. It's not just life on the internet, but the metaverse is life in the internet. It's a way for us to inhabit all sorts of new virtual realities. You want to take a vacation on Mars? Boom, you're there. You want to be six foot six and play for the Los Angeles Lakers? I got you. All right, let's just adjust your height and max out your stats. You want to visit Hogwarts? It's done. You're a wizard, Harry. These are new virtual realities that we can inhabit. The metaverse is not just life on the internet, but it's life in the internet. And we see the rise of this emerging metaverse already in things like virtual and augmented reality. If you've played Pokemon Go, you know what augmented reality is. Now, we see the, uh, we see the emergence of the metaverse in things like cryptocurrencies and NFTs, in things like Fortnite and Roblox, uh, and maybe more commonly to us, uh, in, in things like working and interacting with others remotely. Uh, it's such a common thing that we just kind of embrace that as how life is to be lived from here on out. Now, the aim of this sermon is not to predict what the metaverse will be. Because honestly, no one has any clue what the metaverse will ultimately look like. I mean, some people imagine that the metaverse will be this fully immersive virtual reality where all of life is lived in it, kind of like The Matrix or Ready Player One, if you've seen those movies. But other people think that the metaverse will just be kind of some cool VR games or just having some avatars when you zoom with one another. The point is, no one really knows what the metaverse will be. And yes, while we are many decades away, maybe even one or two full generations away from a full-blown metaverse, if we even get there, I want to argue that many of the underlying impulses driving the technology and business and culture 
of the metaverse are very much present today. That's why we're talking about the metaverse today. In some ways, the metaverse is already here. And the reason why I, I want to bring up the metaverse in today's sermon uh, is because much of those foundational impulses driving the metaverse actually serve as obstacles that hinder us from experiencing the renewal that God desires for us to experience. In other words, you and I, we're going to have a really hard time experiencing renewal, not just because we're coming out of this prolonged season of isolation and disruption, but you and I, we're going to have a very hard time experiencing renewal because we live in a world that embraces these foundational impulses that are driving us towards the metaverse. So the question is, what are these foundational impulses, and how do they serve as obstacles for us to experience actual renewal in Christ? And what are these challenges that we need to be aware of, especially as we seek to enjoy this newness of life that Jesus offers? Well, I want to point out three particular challenges that come with the metaverse. And then afterwards, I want to present three practices that we can engage in to experience renewal even in the metaverse. Now, before we kind of dive into the specific obstacles of the, met, uh, of the metaverse, I do want to say that none of these obstacles are necessarily new. Now, they may be different, uh, newly expressed in terms of scope and application, but they're not new. In fact, uh, when Satan first comes to tempt humanity in the Garden of Eden, we see some very similar dynamics at play. Uh, if you take a look at Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, let me read this for us. Those should be up on the screens for us. It says this. Now, the serpent, referring to Satan, the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. You will know good and evil. All right, as we'll see, uh, there are some eerily similar parallels between what we see Satan doing in the garden and what we see happening in this emerging metaverse. Now, hear me very carefully. This is not to say that the emerging metaverse is a demonic creation. This is not to say that the emerging metaverse is going to be this totally dystopic reality where everything sucks and is crazy and, and terrible. Right? Who knows what the metaverse will be? I, I think actually a lot of good things will arise out of this metaverse. But this is to say that as humans, you and I, we share some common vulnerabilities that can be exploited in such a way that keep us, hinder us from actually experiencing the full and thriving life that God wants us to experience in Christ. And so the question is, what are these things? I'm going to be making references to this Genesis 3 passage as we look at three particular obstacles to renewal in the metaverse. And the first obstacle I want to point out here is, number one, the distortion of identity. The distortion of identity. Life in the metaverse distorts our understanding of who we are. It forms, or maybe more accurately, it deforms our understanding, our perception of what it means to be human. See, in the metaverse, you can choose for yourself whoever you want to be. Whoever you want to be, whatever you want to be. See, in the metaverse, uh, you, you don't have to be formed in the image of God. You don't need to be conformed to the image of Christ. But there is a driving impulse that encourages being formed in your own image. And so if you don't like the way that you look, no worries. Don't like your ethnicity? Not a problem. Don't like the fact that you are a middle-aged man that's starting to bald? Don't worry about it. Just take up this avatar, put on this persona, become this person. You can choose whoever you want to be. See, in the metaverse, identity is this malleable, transformable trait that is largely self-determined. Whereas before, for pretty much all of human history, identity was something that you received, something that was formed by your community, by your friends, by your family, by your culture, by your faith, by the natural reality of living in a physical world. In the metaverse, you can decide for yourself who you want to be. And you can be anything. You can be a dude. You can be a girl. You can be a centaur. You can be Harry Potter. You can be whatever you want to be. And this distortion of identity begins to take place. And interestingly, we see the same distortion in the Garden of Eden. See, when God first creates Adam and Eve, he gives them an identity. I've made you in my own image. You're meant to represent me, my goodness, my glory, my purposes to the rest of creation, and you're meant to live in right relationship with me. 
But very interestingly, Satan's first opening question seeks to dislodge the self from God, seeks to separate Adam and Eve's identity away from God. And he asks, did God actually say that? Do you really have to live under his rule and reign? Hey, you can do whatever you want to do. In fact, you can be whoever you want to be. Now, you might be thinking, but Charles, what's wrong with that? Shouldn't I have the absolute right and freedom to choose whatever or whoever I want to be? I mean, after all, that is the dominant message of our surrounding culture right now, right? Be whoever you want to be. But I think there are some massive consequences that come with this distortion of identity. And one of the major ones I just just want to highlight here is that this distortion brings about massive anxiety and depression. Here's consequence number one. It brings on massive anxiety and depression. We may think that picking and choosing for ourselves who we want to be would bring a greater depth of freedom and comfort. You don't have to be bound by the shackles of reality. All of your internal desires, you are free to put them on full display for everyone else to see. Or you might think that that's true freedom, but the reality is that we actually grow more anxious and more depressed when we are the ones who are solely responsible for defining who we are in contrast to being defined by who God says we are. See, it's not a coincidence that after Adam and Eve eat of the fruit, after they've asserted their self-determined identity, it's not a coincidence that their immediate reaction is to run away in fear and to hide away in shame. See, this distortion of identity brings on massive anxiety and depression. And the reasoning for that is because when we cut off our identity from God and attempt to be these autonomous, self-defined individuals, we now carry the full burden of defining ourselves. We are now solely responsible for determining who we are. And that leads to a very weighty question. What if I choose wrong? In a world of limitless possibilities, what if I choose wrong? Psychologists have actually studied this, and they've coined uh, this debilitating phenomenon, and they call it the paradox of choice. Maybe you've heard this before in psychology classes or on the internet, but they call this the paradox of choice. See, when people are presented with an overwhelming array of options, whether it's cereals in the marketing aisle, whether it's a hotel hotel to book or or food to pick on Yelp, when people are uh, presented with an overwhelming array of options, it's actually detrimental to their psychological and emotional well-being. Or to put it in this different way, uh, maybe you've heard of the term FOMO, right? F-O-M-O, which stands for fear of missing out. Well, there's another related term that might not be as well known called FOBO, F-O-B-O, which stands for fear of better options. And with FOBO, we find ourselves obsessively researching every possible option when we are faced with making a decision because we have this fear that there's some better option somewhere out there. What if I commit to this hotel for my vacation, but there's actually a better hotel at a cheaper price somewhere else? What if I commit myself to going after this career, but end up missing out on a better career? What if I marry this person? There's actually someone else better for me somewhere out there. And so we live life always trying to optimize, constantly hedging our bets, and always feeling paralyzed at the prospect of having to commit to something. And research shows that when we compulsively engage in FOBO, it actually robs us of enjoying the very things in front of us. But not just that, when we compulsively engage in FOBO-like behavior, it actually leads us to feeling massive anxiety and depression. Now, the problem with the metaverse is that it is intentionally designed to display an endless array of possibilities. And when we are confronted with those limitless options involving something as important and foundational and significant as our identity, it can be absolutely crippling. And unfortunately, we already see the effects of this happening with life on the internet, let alone life in the internet. You know, back in November, I don't know if you saw this report, but Instagram, uh, there was a whistleblower at Instagram who leaked an internal report that Instagram itself carried out to assess the effects of its app on young teenage girls. And in this leaked report, it, it showed up that there were significant harm all across the board. Harm ranging from sleep deprivation to anxiety to unhealthy social comparison to body image issues to addictive behavior and to even self injury and suicide. And so much of this negative, bad behavior stemmed from these teenagers feeling overwhelmed at figuring out how to project and form their identity 
in the videos and the stories and the posts and the tags and, and the captions that they put out on this platform. It was just too much. See, the distortion of identity is a huge obstacle to actually experiencing renewal. Well, another obstacle to get even more depressed, number two, that I want to point out here is that this metaverse leads to the disintegration of community. Or rather, it can lead to the disintegration of community. Life in the metaverse can disrupt the very nature of community because it hinders what is required for a community to actually thrive. See, in the metaverse, uh, the metaverse is radically disembodied. And I apologize for all these random terms, but it's radically disembodied, meaning that your physical constraints don't really play a factor. Right? You don't have to be in the same room to be in a meeting with someone else. They, they can literally be 3,000 miles away and you can be in a meeting together. You don't have to live with someone on the same block in the real world to be next door neighbors living right next to each other in the digital world. And so here's the implication of that. See, in the metaverse, you don't have to put up with people that you don't like. Don't like your family, don't like your neighbors, not a problem. Create a new world and create your own family. Right, don't like your church? That's all right. Go worship at a virtual church. Right, don't like how that person sounds or the words that are coming out of their mouth? That's all right. Just put them on mute. You'll never have to hear from them ever again. See, the disembodied nature of the metaverse pushes us towards the disintegration of community. Because here's the thing. Community requires commitment to flourish. But the metaverse allows for commitment-free communities that are catered to your preferences and will not inconvenience you with any unwanted demands. And so if at any time you feel bored, if at any time something slightly annoys you, you can bounce. I'm out of here. I'm, I'm going to just find a new community. And the irony is that this metaverse props up itself as this space that provides some amazing connections. And I agree. I, I think there will be amazing potential for connecting with people from all over the world. But ironically, rather than actually providing deep and meaningful connections, the metaverse actually fuels further isolation. Because what we need for a healthy, robust community are tossed out the window. And we see this disintegration of community also in the Garden of Eden. It's quite telling that when Satan comes to tempt humanity, he doesn't approach them together. I don't know if you've noticed that in the passage. But he only approaches Eve. And that's important to know because when God first creates Adam and Eve, he intentionally designs them to live in complementary relationship with one another. They're meant to share life together in the context of a unified community. And yet here, Satan seeks to intentionally divide and conquer. And there's actually a, a painful consequence to that as he brings disintegration into this community. See, later on, when God actually confronts Adam about what they have done, what does Adam do? He points the finger at Eve. He throws her under the bus, and they engage in this disintegration of community. They play the blame game. See, there is a consequence to this kind of community disintegration. This consequence is that it leads to division and isolation. It leads to division and isolation. The nature of life in the internet fuels distrust and it lends itself to loneliness. And again, that's because in the internet, we don't have the same social ties that bind us together, especially with people who may disagree with us. Because in the real world, if you and I, if we have some serious disagreements on theology, or politics, or whether or not pineapple belongs on pizza, which it does, right? If we have some serious disagreements, because of the nature of embodied community, you and I, we can go back and forth. We have history together. In this context, we can dialogue and observe and relate and hopefully better understand where the other person is coming from. But that's not really possible with life in the internet. I mean, just read YouTube comments, right? Follow a Twitter debate. It gets ugly real fast. See, the metaverse is really great at affirming you, affirming anything and everything about you, but it's really bad at building community, especially with people who disagree with you. And the sad result of this disintegration of community, the, the spike in uh, division and isolation, has been what public health experts are now calling deaths of despair. See, uh, there's a growing segment of the American population who may have hundreds of friends online, but don't really have any close friends in real life. And so when their life goes astray and they need someone to take them to the hospital or they need someone to watch their kids or they need someone to buy groceries for them because they have nothing or because they lack that real sense of community to provide tangible support and meaningful guidance during those tough seasons of life, there have been rising rates of deaths due to things like drug overdose, alcohol consumption, and suicide. 
In other words, people are literally dying from loneliness. In fact, according to a recent study carried out by two economists from Princeton, deaths of despair have actually increased between 50% and nearly 400% depending on the age cohort. And surprisingly, it's not older people, but it's actually younger people who are engaging in these deaths of despair. In fact, the overall life expectancy in the U.S. has actually dropped in recent years because of the rise of these kinds of premature deaths. And those same economists conclude it is the loss of meaning, of dignity, of pride, and of self-respect that comes with the loss of community that brings on despair. Now, in that report, they do point to all kinds of other compounding factors like losing your job or isolation or lack of access to health care. But the point is, all those factors are amplified by the disintegration of community. If all you have is yourself, because all of your friends are online and they can't provide meaningful help and support, then what happens when your life falls apart? See, losing true community is a huge obstacle to experiencing renewal. Lastly, if it can get worse, the third obstacle that I want to point out, number three, is the dethronement of God. The dethronement of God. See, life in the metaverse seeks to overthrow God because it allows us to approximate attributes that only belong to God. Now, here's what I mean. See, in the metaverse, you can have a shallow version of omnipresence. You can be wherever you want to be. In a blink of an eye, you can be in New York, then Dubai, then you can go to Saturn, then you can go to Alderaan. Now, of course, these are all just digital versions of these places. You can also have a shallow version of omnipotence. You can do whatever you want to do. You can fly. You can swim to the depths of the ocean. You can rob a bank. You can destroy a planet. You can also have a shallow version of omniscience. If you have a question, all the world's information is accessible to you in the blink of an eye. And the promise of this metaverse is that with all these great attributes, you now have the power to create a digital utopia. Heaven in the internet. Now, of course, none of these are truly divine attributes. There are mere approximations and shallow approximations at that. But there's enough there to start having us believe that maybe we don't need God after all. Maybe because I can enjoy these attributes for myself, maybe I myself can be God. And that's eerily similar to how Satan tempts Adam and Eve in the garden. See, the final thing that Satan says to Eve before he, convinces her, before he convinces her to eat of that forbidden fruit is this. He tells her, you will be like God, Eve. You will know good and evil. Now here, Satan is not so much saying that Eve will now know the difference between what's right and what's wrong because Eve already knows the difference between what's right and what's wrong. Like God has given her an internal moral compass called a conscience and God has already told her what's right and what's wrong. Rather, what Satan is alluring her with is the illusion that she can determine what is right and what is wrong. She can be the ultimate moral arbiter in the universe and saying this is okay and this is not okay. In other words, Satan is inviting her to sit on the throne that is reserved for God alone. Eve, you can be God. And sadly, the consequence of seeking to dethrone God is that Adam and Eve are driven out of Eden. They break fellowship with God and they're cut off from him. And if you've read the following chapters in the book of Genesis, you know how quickly and terribly everything falls apart. See, as humans, we are made to live in dependent relationship with God. And so we can't thrive, we can't experience renewal if we cut ourselves off from the source of all life. But there's a problem here. See, in that vacuum where God is missing, there's a consequence for dethroning God. And that consequence is that we will rush headlong into idolatry. We will worship other gods. See, as people made in the image of God, we are fundamentally created to worship The human heart is designed to worship, namely to enjoy God and to glorify him forever. And so here's what that means. The removal of God from our lives through the metaverse does not remove the need for worship in our lives. Instead, our fundamental need to worship will be met by worshiping new gods. And we see this happening right now. Everywhere we look, even as traditional religions are starting to diminish, New forms of religion are very much alive and well. There are new creeds all over the place. I mean, when you drive through your neighborhood, you'll probably see these lawn signs that people have on their homes. And they say, in this house, we believe X, Y, and Z, new creeds. There are new sins. For some, new sins are whiteness. For others, new sins are taking the vaccination. 
Uh, there are new gatekeepers. There are new sacred texts. There are new identity markers, new acts of worship. There are new ways to be saved. There are new heavens and new hells. There are new gods. But unlike the true God, these gods are cruel. And they will demand everything, but they will give nothing in return. See, the dethronement of God is a huge obstacle to experiencing renewal. So those are some of the obstacles to renewal that are amplified by the metaverse. Again, these are not new things. They've been here since the fall. We, we see this in Genesis 3. But they're being amplified by this new world being created called the metaverse. Right? The distortion of identity, the disintegration of community, and the dethronement of God. Now, I've spent a lot of time outlining some of these obstacles. And again, just to clarify, I don't think the metaverse will be some crazy dystopia where everything is terrible. Again, I think a lot of good things will come out of this metaverse. But I think there are some inherent challenges to living in the metaverse. Challenges that are very much present here and now already. And so the bigger question is, how can we navigate these challenges? How can we navigate these obstacles? How do we go about life in a metaverse-driven world in such a way that we can still experience renewal here and now? Let me just briefly point out three points of application in light of those three obstacles. Uh, first, in light of a metaverse that distorts the self, we need to build habits that deny the self. Build habits that deny the self. In a world that puts me, myself, and I front and center, we need to engage in disciplines that help remove ourselves from the center. In fact, it says in Matthew chapter 16, verses 24 to 25, then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Here, Jesus tells us that we find life not when we elevate ourselves, but when we deny ourselves. So what are some of these practices that we can engage with so that we can better deny ourselves? What are these habits that deny the self? Well, there are a lot. Right? There are things like fasting, serving, simplicity, confessing your sins, saying no to that temptation. But let me just highlight one that I think might be especially helpful in navigating the metaverse. And that's generosity. Generosity. See, the metaverse says, be selfish. Treat yourself. The world revolves around you. Even now, this mad dash towards cryptocurrencies is all about not bettering the world, but making a profit for yourself. I don't care if the person who buys my cryptocurrency after me ends up losing a bunch of money. As long as I make money, I'm fine. The world revolves around you. That's what the metaverse says. But generosity says, hey, look beyond yourself. And seek to meet the needs of those around you. And not just in a shallow, hey, let me feel good about myself because I dropped in a dollar here or there. But in an actual way that is sacrificial and that actually costs us something. Maybe you really wanted to buy that new iPhone to enjoy for yourself. But instead, you put that money towards supporting the work of missions. Or buying groceries for your elderly neighbors who, are making, who have a very hard time right now making ends meet. Or maybe you really wanted to enjoy your weekend by binging Singles Inferno for five hours on your couch. But instead, you choose to meet up with that friend who's been feeling lonely. Or to pour into that college student who feels lost navigating, uh, not navigating life. Or to meet up with your parents because you haven't seen them in a while. Now, don't get me wrong. There is a place for self-care. And, and there is a real danger to running on empty. But I highly doubt that we are in much danger of that in our culture. I think we have so much to give, and I think we've kept so much for ourselves. See, in a world that hyper-centers the self, we need to engage in practices that actually deny the self. So deny yourself as you live with generosity. Move beyond yourself to see others around you. That's the first thing. Secondly, another practice in light of a metaverse that disintegrates community is building habits that build up community. In a world that shatters healthy, robust communities, we need to engage in disciplines that help foster the kind of communities that we need to actually experience revival and renewal. In fact, it says in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 to 25, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. We're called to engage with one another in community, particularly within the context of the local church. And as we just read, a major purpose of this kind of community is to stir one another up towards love and good works. See, unlike the metaverse, which is really good at affirming you, a gospel-driven community is meant to form you, meant to help you grow to become more and more like Christ. 
And furthermore, as we just read, there is an inherently embodied aspect to this kind of community. We're told to not neglect meeting together. In other words, there's something about being physically present together, seeing each other face-to-face, inhabiting the same space. There's something about that that, that that is essential for fostering the kind of community that we need. And I think deep down, we all know that. We know that no emoji or gif can be a substitute for a big bear hug after a long and tiring day. We know that no Spotify playlist, no matter how great the music curation is, we know that no Spotify playlist can be a substitute for the glorious nature of hearing one another sing together Sunday after Sunday. And we know that no, no mukbang, no matter how delicious the food may be, is as satisfying as sharing a meal with some good friends. And we know that no confessional vulnerability on social media, no matter how many likes it may receive, is as refreshing as honestly sharing your burdens and your struggles with a fellow brother or sister. See, if we want to experience renewal, we need to build real life-on-life embodied community. And a practice that will help us to build this kind of community is hospitality. Open up your homes, invite people in. Share meals together. Share life together. See, our homes are not to be fortified castles to keep the world out, but they are to be inviting spaces to bring people in. Now, here's the thing. You don't have to own a home or your own apartment to be hospitable. You can simply be hospitable by reaching out to others in a welcoming heart. Maybe take some time this week to reach out to that friend or that church member that you've been thinking about, and you're wondering how they're doing. Text them. Give them a call. Set a day to, to grab lunch together sometime in the future, right? Pray for them. Stir them on to love and good works. Point them to Jesus. Make room in your life for them and be hospitable. Build up community. And that's how we can pursue renewal even in the metaverse. Lastly, we'll be done with this. A uh, third practice in light of a metaverse that dethrones God is building habits that prioritize worship. Prioritize worship. See, in a world that seeks to dismiss God, we need to engage in disciplines that seek to draw our hearts and our minds to behold his glory again and again and again. And as we engage in worship, that's how we can experience renewal. See, there's a built-in mechanism of renewal that God has designed to take place in worship. Uh, If you take a look at 2 Corinthians 3, verse 18, we're gonna wrap up our sermon for today with this. It says this, and we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, which is essentially what we're doing when we worship God. As we behold the glory of the Lord, we are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. That's renewal. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. See, when we engage in worship, we are brought face to face with the living Christ. And as we look at Jesus, we begin to look more like Jesus. It's the same exact process that happens when you've been dating someone for a long time or married to someone for a very long time, right? The more time you spend with them, the more you realize, man, I'm starting to become more and more like them. Their habits, their personalities, their jokes, their humor, all of that is trying to rub off on me. And pretty soon I'm realizing that their life is significantly shaping my life. And a very similar process takes place as we behold Jesus in worship. See, when our hearts are brought before Christ, the Holy Spirit begins to shape and transform not just our hearts, but our entire lives to look more and more like Jesus. See, there is a renewal that we can experience only when we worship. Now, I know that coming out of this past season, it's been very easy to neglect corporate worship. But church, if we want to experience this newness of life in Christ, we need to engage in worshiping God together. Now, is this inconvenient? Absolutely. (laughs) But we don't worship because it's convenient. Rather, we worship because we need Jesus. And as as we come week after week, bearing our burdens, bearing the struggles of a long, tiring, busy week, as we come as we are, as we confess our sins, as we receive renewed promises of the gospel, as we hear from God through his word, as we pray, as we sing, as we fellowship, as we gather, as we encounter the living Christ again and again, that's how we experience renewal. See, we can combat this this tendency to dethroning God in the metaverse as we prioritize worship, and that's how we can experience renewal. Church, as we find ourselves living in a world that is marked by all these impulses that are driving us towards the metaverse, we need to engage in these disciplines. You know, we're not even living life in the internet just yet. 
But already, so much of our life is already on the internet. In a recent study, uh, I, I think they said that the average American adult now spends almost eight hours of their day, each day, on their screens. And this is not including the time that they spend at work looking at their screens, which means for some people, they spend more time staring at a screen than they do even sleeping. And, and in those eight hours, day after day, week after week, year after year, you are being shaped in some significant ways. Day after day, you're being bombarded with messages and tweets and videos and ideas and worldviews that form, and maybe more appropriately deform, how you understand yourself and others, the world and God. And so if we want to navigate this well, friends, we need to be disciplined. We need to cultivate these practices that help us to deny ourselves, that build up community, that seek to prioritize worship. And so Family Chapel, let, let's strive to pursue renewal in this season. Let's overcome these obstacles as we seek to cultivate these habits so that we can enjoy the newness of life that God offers to us in Christ. Can you bow your heads with me at this time? Uh, spend some time in prayer and reflection as we respond to God's word together. Would you just take this time to acknowledge the real challenges we face? You know, whether you're hearing about the metaverse for the first time or this is something that you've looked at for a while, just recognize that the world that we are about to inhabit is going to make it really difficult to experience the newness of life that God desires for us to experience. And in the face of those challenges, would you, would you pray, Lord, help me to deny myself in a world that screams, put yourself first. In a world that screams, the world revolves around you. Would you help me to deny myself? Would you pray, help me to build up community? In a world that says, if, if anyone bothers you, if anyone makes you inconvenient, then cut them out of your life. In that world, would you, would you help me to commit? Would you help me to lean in? Would you help me to open up? Would you help me to build community? Would you pray, help me to prioritize worshiping you in a world that has a thousand different gods that, that promise a thousand different ways to find a thousand different salvations, would you pray, Lord, help me to know that you are the way, you are the truth, you are the life. Would you pray that God would grant you the grace that you need to navigate these challenges and to experience renewal, knowing that there is true life in Christ. Church, let's take some time to pray together as we respond to God's word. Let's pray. Father, as we look out at the world, we recognize the many challenges that lay before us. But Father, we're also reminded what Jesus has said, that while we may not be of the world, we are in the world, that we're here, not on accident, but you've purposely placed us here. And even though the challenges may be great, Father, we're reminded also what Jesus has said, that we can take heart knowing that he has overcome the world. So would you help us to be agents of renewal in a culture, in a place, in a world that is so fixated on death, that leads to people not thriving, that leads to the breakdown of communities, that leads to isolation and depression, that leads to false worship and idolatry. Father, would you help us to be agents of renewal that bring the newness of life that you desire for all peoples to experience, that start in us, in our lives, in our hearts, in this church, in our families, in our homes, in our communities, in our apartments, in our schools, in our workplaces. But I, I pray that we would experience renewal in this new year. And rather than being daunted by, by, the, by the oncoming challenges, Lord, help us to fix our eyes on the one who has already overcome. We thank you so much for this time. 
pray that we would respond to you even now with faith and trust and obedience. We love you, Lord. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.